Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> hey, 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 don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila. Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to thenextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Come on, you had that, you posted that thing on Facebook, 116. Yeah. Woo. At some point, the temperature becomes an obscenity. You know, at some point, it just doesn't even matter anymore. <laughs> you just cross a line where it's just like, yeah, it's hot. I feel like we have this conversation every year right around the same time. I feel like we do. <laughs> Here it is again. Um, it is again. You got my trailer. I got your trailer. Yeah, we're ready to go. In fact, I've already pushed the button. Oh, snap. 
You sneaky little Ding, guy. Diggity dog. <laughs> we almost had a tooth emergency. Luckily, I mean, we survived. Mm. The son, you know, he's at that age. They're just falling out. <laughs> just pop out all yeah. over the place. You come out with gums, and then you just wait to be gums again. Yep. All right, life is just one long journey back to gumming your food. The circle of life. Mm. <laughs> Uh, it turns out it's not ready, not ready to come out. So yeah, they don't like it when you just start tugging on them. No, I tried. I tried flicking it. Then I t- he was afraid it was going to hurt. So I said, "Here, you pull it out. Let's just count to three. And when you pull it out at exactly the same time, I'll tell you what I'm going to. I'm going to pinch you real, real hard." <laughs> <laughs> he just looks at me. What? <laughs> <laughs> I promise you won't even think about it. That's right. <laughs> Uh, you got any good stories for the week? Anything good happen to you? Well, uh, yeah, two. Two? Uh, in a row? Yeah, two in a row. Son. So they're, they're short stories. All right. Yeah, short story man tonight. So last week, after talking about Thief, I decided that I was going to work on on finishing my Michael Mann uh, you know, filmography, since there were only two films that I'm missing from it. Which, which ones were? Those? The Keep and Public Enemies. You hadn't seen Public Enemies, huh? I hadn't. I, I've now rented it. And it's oh, you haven't out, watched it? Yet. It's sitting waiting for me to watch. No, but I decided to watch The Keep because it was streaming. Yeah. And that man, one I haven't seen. I don't know if you should. <laughs> it's so awful. It was so <laughs> hard to get through. It was so hard to get through. I hated it. Oh, wow. it's just it's misery. <laughs> Complete misery to sit through that one. Well, yeah. that's, a, that's a darn shame. And then he made Thief, which thank God, because, <laughs> boy. He could have really just uh, not had a career after after that one. Oh, that's uh, that's too bad. Yeah. So that's my one story. Just you know. Okay. Don't see the keep first. Yeah. Don't see the keep. I am going to watch Public Enemies, even though I hear many bad things about that one too. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing, I took my daughter to see Maleficent. Oh, I hear it was terrible. It's not terrible. I mean, I enjoy it. I think it's you know it's in line of Wicked. Yeah, I, I think it works. I, I I think it's you know it's it's enjoyable. I didn't ha- I didn't hate it. I, I, I you know I, there were definitely parts I really enjoyed, um, but she came out, and this this feels big to me, considering. All right. She came out, and I said, "So, did you like that one?" And she said, oh, "I loved it." I'm like, what did you like so much about it? And she named some parts that she loved, and and she was very confused. And I had to really talk her through some parts of the story, because you know it's adult motivations, why people do things, and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I said, so where would you put it? Where would you rank it? It's my favorite movie. I'm like, really? More than Frozen? Uh-oh. And she said, yes. <laughs> I was like, ah, uh, wow. Yeah, I gotta say, I, I mean, it's not better than Frozen, but, but she thinks it is. She thinks it is, and and I reminded her of Frozen and parts in Frozen that she loved, and she still says this one's better. Now, is it the fact that this is the more immediate film that she's just seen, and now if we watch Frozen, will she say it's better? Yeah. You know, it's that kind of child uh, mindset. I don't know, but I was really surprised to to find that something would top Frozen, because that's been really hard to beat ever since she saw it. I didn't think it would happen, especially this soon. Yeah, that that was really fast. She's a flippity gibbet. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Oh, yes. That's awesome. Congratulations. That's got to make you happy. It's got to make you you happy that you can listen to some different music, hopefully. (laughs) I'm not sure if she's going to want to put the Maleficent. Hey, let's (laughs) listen to James Newton Howard, honey. (laughs) Let's, let's put on some James Newton Howard. <laughs> what do you think? We're not ready for that yet. Or the not haunt, ready. Or the haunting cover of uh, uh, what's, that, what's the song? Uh, uh, I have uh, no idea. None. Once upon, Once upon a dream. The uh, the song from the original Sleeping Beauty. They have a very kind of haunting cover of it. Nice. It's I hear they're doing Beauty and the Beast now. They're That's doing one. that. They're doing Cinderella. Cinderella it's live action. Become, it's become the big thing now. They've realized, what else can we milk? We already put them all on Broadway. Hey, let's do live action versions. Uh, Either a live action version or a live action twist on the story. No kidding. Enough. Yeah. Uh, 
there was some other I, I feel like there was some other big film news this week that surprised me. Oh, what's his name? Chronicle? Oh Director? yeah, that was yeah, Trask. Yeah. So he's doing uh, he's been tapped to do the second Star Wars spin off. Uh this will be after the first Star Wars spin off. And I assume after the second Star Wars postquel. <laughs> I don't know. What are we calling them? Uh, they don't really count as sequels, right? Because it's a... What, if you say post school, it actually sounds like you're speaking in a Star Warsian language. Yeah, and that's what I'm going for. That's <laughs> what I want. Um, and so, anyhow, that's what I was thinking about uh, today. That I'm. This is one I'm excited about, but it goes back to our conversation we've had uh, uh, repeatedly. Uh, young, uh, brilliant indie directors do something cool, get slated and given a lot of money. Uh, and they just roll the dice, hope to get lucky. Yeah. Um, I, it'll be curious. It'll be interesting to see what happens with that. What's the, Do you know the the backstory on the uh, the latest Oz animated thing? Um, other than I've, I've heard it's garbage. Legends of Oz. Is that the I, I don't know. I don't know. I heard it's just terrible. Legends of Oz. So uh, what it, it, I've also heard that it's terrible. But uh, there is there's uh, there's apparently a story. I didn't know that. Yeah, that it turns out there was some sort of deceptive tactics used to raise money uh, to er, from independent investors for this oh, film. Oh, really? Yeah. And so uh, usually what happens, I uh, you know, and you could probably speak to this better than I can. But usually what happens when you get someone to invest in film projects, they invest in like a a. A basket of films, right? In a in in like a a set. Yeah. Uh, so if you have, you know, um, uh, you know, if you roll the dice on a bunch of Disney projects, you know, some of them are going to suck, but if you know, one of them likely is going to be another, you know, Transformers. So right, right. Uh, and and so that's the that's the the theory. And it turns out what happened here. Uh, I don't. I'm I'm trying to figure it out. The producers Ryan Carroll, uh, Roland Carroll, and uh, Bonnie Radford. For Legend of Oz, uh, there is some report that these guys raise money from people who don't understand how to raise money for a movie. They actually raised money, and it's uh, terrible. The film is apparently terrible, and there are mm-hmm. people who worked on the film who wonder how it even got made. That uh, you know, there is no way that the money that they raised actually went into making the film. Yeah, uh, it's got a seventy million dollar budget. Yes, and there is no way that it is a seventy million dollar film. That's what, and this is the these are like the animators yeah, <laughs> who are right. saying this, uh, and uh, so it's uh, it, it it's I think it's one of those cautionary tales that's just sort of popped up on my radar screen that I find really fascinating. Uh, yeah, yeah, because this was also pro- they produced the film over in India actually, right? Where it's not quite as expensive to produce. <laughs> yeah, so where is that money? Uh, so I think it's I think it's there is some sort of an uh, of a civil investigation going on, and that's uh, that's too bad. Uh, but it, it's um, you know one of those things. I just find it fascinating. So yeah, uh, that's a story. Of the that way. is a story. Should, I found I, I found an interesting story on cartoonbrew dot com about it. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Lots of interesting stuff. Is it is it more? What do you have that's more than what I just said? Just a lot of it, but oh. I—it's just a lot. I can't go through the whole well, thing. Okay. Right now. No, go ahead and read it. The, oh. the seventeen-page comment thread. <laughs> <laughs> we go through that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so you get the point. I mean, each of these investors paid a hundred grand, and um, that there is some sort of uh, Hollywood industrial complex that destroyed the film, wow. which is possible. But I believe that there was some uh, shenanigans, some there, and possibly a hootenanny. Mm, shenanigans and a hootenanny. Yeah. That spells trouble. Mm-hmm. Right here in River City. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's, the, that's the one set of newses that I have. Wow. Very yeah. interesting. Shall we tell the people where we're from? Where are we from? People, uh, I'm so glad to be here. It's the next reel. Uh, we spoil movies. I'm Pete Wright. That's Andy Nelson. Yo. 
And what we're going to do uh, uh, this week is uh, we're going to talk about a fantastic film. Yes. An American Werewolf in London, 1981, John Landis film. Uh, and so you want to make sure that you know everything you do about The Next Reel. So you need to go over to thenextreel.com. You need to subscribe to the show in iTunes. You need to read the blog stylings of the once and future king, Steve Sarmento. You need to uh, uh, fo- join us on Facebook for our uh, for because uh, that's where the talking happens. Uh, or you can, uh, you can of course, tweet us, Instagram us, and that is where a great deal of excitement occurs each week in mm. the Instagram outsmarted Stephen Smart versus the people hashtag guess the what is it guess the movie <laughs> guess the movie <laughs> guess the movie hashtag pony prize challenge <laughs> <laughs> and how did we do this week uh, this week was a it was a good week because nobody had clearly seen the movie <laughs> it was pretty uh, you know was, part of the fun is just reading all the comments as people realize that this is a movie they've just never seen before awesome. and and it gets to a point where it's like okay i'm waiting for an image that's going to give me some clues that i can search for on google and uh it was violent saturday which is a uh a film that i haven't seen but it's on my uh list i've been meaning to see it for years now and uh it uh it took almost the full week uh before uh ben lott finally Go ben was lott. able to he was finally able to google search it figure it out <laughs> <laughs> I love it how the Google search has become the, uh, part of the the cheat has become part of the game. That's right. That makes well, that's yeah. enormously satisfying. It, it gets to a point where it's just like I mean, you know, we gotta we gotta challenge the people in one way or another. It's either the image, or it's got to be something that they can. You know, it, the challenge is in the, the search. That's right. So it's the it's, image yeah. of the race. The image of the yeah. race. People. That's, that's right. Fantastic. That's right. Uh, so uh, Ben Lott. How do we, you know, I think we forgot to talk about our blot score last week. Um, yeah. I think, we did very, I, I, I think we did well, though. I think we did. Yeah. I think that he, was for Blowout? That was for Blowout. I think he... I he think did he like Blowout. A, a, agreed on Blowout. Yeah, I think he agreed more with you. Although, like I said, I think Nancy so Allen did, has, So did you, eventually. <laughs> so, and Nancy Allen has dropped in my <laughs> estimation a little bit uh, the more she sits with me. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, yes. But I, I do really love Blowout, yeah. and Ben did too. And yeah. then Thief. Yeah. Turns out uh, we were uh, a hit with that one too. Yeah, I love that. I think we're at three to one to one with the Ben Lott score right 311. now. 311. Yeah. It's, like, it's like binary. Or it's like, not binary anymore because we've got a three. Yeah, that doesn't make it binary. But I just, you know, I'm just, it's like it's like we're building hex code. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do you ever have a hex editor? I don't know what that is. Oh, come on. So I think it was, uh, this is, oh, this takes me way back. This was, it was the best thing ever when you could get a video game for, uh, like, I would get, like, you know, The Bard's Tale for my Apple II. And uh, <laughs> you, you could get a hex editor and you could go in and you could actually, you know, change parameters of the characters. Um, like, if you knew, if you knew what, like, little bits to flip, uh, you could, you could change the parameters of the character and give yourself, you know, unlimited hit points or, you know, god uh, god power. <laughs> I, think, I think there was one in for Hexen. That was the first, it was like a Doom-like game. That was the first time I actually cheated to the point where I had a character that could fly. Wow. That, that wasn't supposed to be able to fly. Is that why they call them Hex Points? No, hex no, code. totally unrelated. Hex, <laughs> hex editor. It's a. No, it's you see. Now we have to. Now I have to teach you how to count. <laughs> we'll do that later. Okay. All right. One, hey. three, four. Hey. <laughs> We're gonna start with base two, <laughs> and we'll work up to base seven. Mm-hmm. Hey, uh, this has been a really great conversation, but I think <laughs> sure has. I think we should probably do trailers. Hey, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm going to go first. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go first. Uh, only because I'm in a hurry, because my movie actually opens next week. Oh, well, so I gotta go do, I got to go first. Uh, I'm doing Hellion. Have you heard about this movie? I hadn't until and you told me to watch it. Are you a little bit excited about it? I am very excited about it. The film is uh, written and directed by Kat Candler, who is uh, a couple of years younger than I am, and that is starting to... 
starting to be real. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, she is, uh, she's known for other movies I haven't seen, 2000's Cicadas, uh, 2013, Black Metal, 2009, Love Bug. She's done, a, you know, a handful, a, a nice, uh, healthy handful of um, shorts. Uh, and this looks like her first feature. It stars uh, the uh, goodly, kindly Aaron Paul. Mm-hmm. And uh, Aaron Paul uh, is... Well, I think the the real star of the film is going to be the kid, Josh Wiggins, uh, and uh, it's a it's about a, a, a heavy metal and motocross obsessed thirteen year old, uh, and it is kind of a, a a sad story, coming of age story, coming of age in not a very great environment, and so it's, yeah, um, yeah, and so Aaron Paul is uh, plays a dad, and he's he's a little bit of a deadbeat, and so he's trying to figure out. Which end is up himself, and and uh, the trailer is very intense. Lots of fun motorcycle stuff, uh, lots of things that I watch, and I think, wow, I hope my kids don't go through that. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely where I was with this yeah. trailer. Is yeah, that, uh, yeah it uh, it looks like it's got uh, you know there's a definitely kind of a dark streak running in it. This is yeah. not quite as uh, I I haven't seen Boyhood yet, but this might be a little darker than Boyhood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, you know, I think it, it looks uh, imminently worth seeing Juliette Lewis, Aaron Paul, Josh Wiggins, and many other people I don't know. Um, but I think uh, I think it's on my list. It opens next weekend. Wow. The 13th. That looks good. Yep. Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th. Mm-hmm. All right. Your turn. You know, mine is just one that kind of popped up, and it, it just looked so kind of quirky and uh, like an interesting little character story that I, I really wanted to talk about it. It's called Land Ho! Exclamation point. So it's Land Ho! is really <laughs> what it's called. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and totally. it just, this looks like one of those uh, total art house films about uh, just two old men on a journey. Uh, but it's funny, and they're taking this trip. It's it's basically two, uh, you know, former brothers-in-law. I think, uh, you know, it sounded like one of the uh, one of their wives had passed away, and the the other one comes to kind of help his brother-in-law get out of his funk. And so they he decides they're going to take a road trip in Iceland. <laughs> oh my God! I <laughs> where all the ladies are so hot, <laughs> and. Uh, it just looks like such a quirky little character film. Uh, Aaron Katz and Martha Stevens wrote and directed it. And, I, you know, I'm not that familiar with their other films that they have done. Um, Dance Party USA, Quiet City, Cold Weather. Um, not, I haven't seen anything that they've done before. Um, and, uh, but I have seen, oh, and then uh, Martha Stevens has done uh, uh, Passenger Pigeons and Pilgrim Song, a couple other films I've never seen before. Um, but I have seen the actor Paul Earhorn or Einhorn in um, a wonderful film that I watched uh, last year called This Is Martin Bonner. And it was just this, he played this quiet character who uh, was basically working as a, um, uh, he had moved o- o- over to Nevada and he was he kind of befriends this guy who's recently released from prison and it's just kind of this quiet little friendship story is a very good film i really enjoyed it and and paul einhorn has this uh quiet presence about him that uh it just i don't know there's something different about watching him that i really enjoy and his presence in this film also strikes me as more of that presence than i want to see and uh so yeah that's that's the movie it it is this quirky little film about these two guys kind of just having this journey in Iceland figuring you know, out how to move past things. Well, I don't know from nothing about the story, but I had a terrific time watching this because I thought you were sending this to me as some sort of an invitation for like 30 years from now. <laughs> hey, hey, let's make it so. Honest to God, I thought this was you and me. We're going to retire from this silly podcast business. <laughs> 30, 30 years from now. <laughs> yeah, in 30 years. And then we're going to go We're gonna go to Iceland. I don't think we need to wait that long, frankly. I think we should just go to Iceland. 
I think we should. It looks terrific. I'm so excited. Before, I hadn't heard of it either. You sent me the trailer, and I had to watch it three times, uh, twice for myself and once because I needed my wife to see where I was going to be. <laughs> uh, and uh, I just, I, I really, honest to God, I can't wait yeah. for, for either one, the movie or the trip. Or the trip, yeah. Yep. yep. Here, here. Well, and then, you know, uh, Walter Mitty. Yeah, also is up in Iceland. Right, and so we're going to go, but we have to be, you know, spry enough to be able to longboard down a volcano. Yes, yes. That'll be Although an important part of the agenda. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm going to cross off, leap out of helicopter into shark-infested waters, though. I, I think I can live without that on my bucket list. I don't, I don't think you can. Yeah, I think that what they say, yes. I think what they say is you haven't lived until you've <laughs> actually survived jumping into shark infested waters. <laughs> That's actually then, on the like on the on the 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 you know the flyer, the pamphlet. Followed quickly by and then he died. <laughs> <laughs> is now in the shark's on belly his, <laughs> on his on his tombstone in an empty grave. <laughs> He he thought he hadn't lived. <laughs> Boy, was he wrong. <laughs> Boy, was he wrong. Hey, uh, I can't wait. Yeah. Sounds like yeah. a great thing. When did, yep. did you say when it opens? It opens July 11th. All right. We should Land ho! Land ho! <laughs> uh, okay, good times. Let's... Uh, wait a minute. What movie were you... That was real. That was a sad little werewolf. Shut up. That was totally real in the woods behind my house. Did you hear that? What was it? A coyote. There aren't any coyotes in England. What happened to them? Well, the police report said they were attacked by an escaped lunatic. Must have been a very powerful man. Jack and I were not attacked by a man. It's an animal. A wolf. Did he say a wolf? Yes, I believe he did. Did you get a good look at the man who attacked you? Doctor, my memory is fine. It's my sanity I'm beginning to worry about. You've never had bad dreams before? Well, sure, as a kid, but never so real. Never so weird. I'm going to look into your eyes. My friend Jack was just here. Your dead friend, Jack. Hi, David! He told me that I will become a monster in two days. The supernatural, the power of darkness, it's all true. Please believe me. Believe what? That tomorrow night, beneath the full moon, I'll sprout hair and fangs and eat people? You'd be surprised what horrors a man is capable of. Are you all right now? I don't know. I'll let you know the next full moon. I'm a werewolf. You're going to change. You'll kill people. You'll become... I know. A monster. David, don't lose control! Control? What control? David, I can help you. No, I'm not safe to be with. you got to stay away from me. Run! And everybody dies in it. It's very bloody. Hey, <laughs> how'd this movie uh, hold up to you? Uh, the good uh, Mr. Landis. Yes, yes, crazy little uh, Mr. Landis. He's a he's an interesting film director, um, and this I mean I've watched this movie fairly recently. This is uh, I think uh, a horror classic that I I love. I just have it on high on my list, so I, I always enjoy watching this film. How about you? Did it hold up or no? Are you kidding? It totally held up, and I don't have this high on my list. This is not one that I watch regularly. I have seen it probably twice and i enjoyed it both times i tr triple dog enjoyed it this time <laughs> is that a thing 
<laughs> but just don't stick your tongue to a pole wait, afterwards. <laughs> I, uh, I deeply enjoyed it, and I was so surprised at how well it held up for me. Even the, the effects, the, the practical effects, and the, the stretching hand paws, and the, the gaping mouth maw, and the, the transformation was terrific. I had a blast watching this movie. And I think one of the things I, I'm so excited to talk to you about is just the, the, um, the style of filmmaking that Landis uh, adopted for this film uh, to, to build in intensity the the editing style i think is really uh I, I think really lends to and and allows it to be more exhilarating than uh than it 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 would be if it had been just cut straight there you yeah. go there you go that's my pitch and jenny agutter a gutter yeah. agutter so adorable wow oh yes this is where i fell in love with her huh. and that's why i was so happy to see her again in captain america 2 uh, you know, because she's just great. You know, I mean, I, I I never quite got into Walkabout. It was never a film I, I that really hooked me in. I mean, I, I enjoyed it enough, but this is the one where I think it was easy to say you could fall in love with her. Oh, totally. She yeah. is just delightful. Mm-hmm. And boy, does she fall in love with that American boy quickly. <laughs> yeah, in a hurry. <laughs> the crazy one in the hospital. Sure, I'll yeah, take. Yeah. Why him did home. you come back to my house with one bed and really room? <laughs> He was uh, all into that accent, I tell you. Oh, all into the accent. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, okay, so where do you want to start? Oh, I, I, I guess we'll just start with the story. Okay. Uh, Werewolves. So, again, this is, uh, this is Pete and Andy <laughs> in 1981. <laughs> this is what we were doing 30 years ago. <laughs> this, this is how our, our trip to Iceland will hopefully not end up. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Goodness. An American werewolf in Reykjavik. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you ever have you seen uh, John Oliver's new show? No, I haven't. Oh, he had the best bit the other night. He was comparing American internet speeds to you know where we fall in the international internet speed list, right? And he says we fall second to Estonia, a country which, by all rights, is still re- preparing for a Shrek attack, <laughs> and. That's sort of how I feel about an American werewolf in London. There they are walking the moors, and uh, and uh, you know, no Shrek, but no wow. Shrek. Uh, <laughs> so these two guys, they are decided that they're going to do northern uh, northern England and then head down to London. They have three months to tool around the uh, 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 the <laughs> Her Majesty's Magic Kingdom, <laughs> and uh, and that is when they make the mistake. They violate the trope, and they leave the road. You never leave the road. Nope, nope. They I gotta say though, boy, what? those villagers are not really helping. Room of control. <laughs> <laughs> they really are just. I mean, come on. No, you know not there's good. werewolves roam, roaming around out there. Convince the guys to stay. Yeah, that's a that's a real. Uh, that is the only I think structural problem that I have with this film is that it falls apart so early and has to build itself back up as sort of a different movie. Um, because it is, uh, it, it's like, uh, why, I, I don't get the motivation behind the villagers not sharing, or not trying at least to give these guys shelter. Now, I, I recognize that if they had given them shelter, it would have been, it, you know, it, it would have taken some hoops to get out of that. But I think violating that, uh, it, it, it's just a little bit off. That is one of the, the, one of the points that, you know, it sticks. It's like, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't work that great. I mean, I, I love the, uh, that closed offedness that the villagers have. And yeah. For that, I think, okay, I can kind of buy into it, although it is harder to buy into on the night when the wolf is howling and it's a full moon, it, or, you know, it's, it's, it's harder to buy into that whole thing. Yeah. Um, but that's just one of those things. I mean, it's, it's a, I don't know how John Landis would have made the story work otherwise. I mean, he would have had to really just have them walking without stopping in the village and stopping in the, in to talk at the slaughtered lamb to all these people. And really literally would be like they're walking and then it's nighttime, the moors and the wolf attacks. That's really the only other way I think he could have done it. Well, but did they really need that at all? Right. Because they, I mean, the villagers, uh, let me just ask that differently. Did they need to stop in the 
slaughtered lamb. Well, no, and that's well at all because that, the guy, the driver of the truck that dropped them off after they made all the purient sheep jokes, mm-hmm. uh, he's the guy who already said, you know, stay off the stay on the road. Yeah, be careful on the, the moor. Or, yeah, right. Yeah, right. I yeah. mean, he, they already got a warning. Yeah. They beef up the warning a little bit, and then they don't even need the villagers at all. They have the big attack, uh, you know, and... Well, uh, they do need the villagers because somebody has to kill the, that's the right. werewolf. They can before. have the villagers yeah. kill the werewolf, and the first time we see the villagers is when they come and, and they do that nice close over his POV as he's laying down on the ground in the field. Yeah. That could no, be the first I, time we see the villagers. They didn't. I, I think they didn't need the village at all. And until then we they, can... Yeah. And then we can get more of the closed offedness when the doctor comes to right. visit the villagers, and we could have built that scene up a little more with a little more of the. I mean, there there is that nice conversation that he has uh, when he goes outside uh, with uh, with one of them before the other one comes and yeah. kind of ixnay on the airwolf way. Um, but <laughs> he said airwolf. <laughs> oh, Jan Michael Vincent. That's a, that's a, a little different. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, cocaine. Yeah. <sighs> but the, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and that I think actually would have been, uh, might have been better. Um, the thing that we would have lacked is a little more of the setup for this world of the werewolves. And that's the only thing that I think that opening does give us. They go into this pub that's got the, the star on the wall and the candles burning over it. And that's where Griffin Dunn and David Naughton get to have the conversation about that's the sign of the werewolf. Haven't you ever seen uh, the Lon Chaney Jr. movie, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, that's really all we get out of the beginning that uh, other than some levity. But I think that our rewrite is better. I actually do. I feel very confident that our rewrite is better. And we should submit it to Mr. Landis immediately post haste for a potential remake. Let's do it. Okay, uh, but from there, I uh, I quite like it. You know, this is a this is an interesting film. John Landis actually came up with this idea back in 1969 when he was actually over in Europe. I think he was in uh, uh, Yugoslavia um, filming Kelly's Heroes. Um, I didn't know this about John Landis, but he actually. Um, before he started directing films with Schlock, which was his his first film, um, he had uh, done stunt work and uh, just a whole bunch of other stuff. He was actually um, over there. I actually don't know what he was doing over there, but he was in Yugoslavia, and he was driving around, and he ended up meeting a... Uh, or he was... They stopped at the side of the road because these gypsies were having a funeral and um, he was watching this funeral and he kind of became fascinated by it. And he said it, it was really strange. It looked like a set straight out of, uh, f- uh, out of the original, the Wolfman movie from uh, 19, the early 1940s, 41 or 42. Mm-hmm. And, and that just kind of gave him this idea of what if it, you know, what if these you know people, and, and I guess the way that the gypsies bury the people, uh, at the funeral is they dig a really just deep hole and they bury them basically feet first as if they're standing. And then they do this thing and they're like, why are you burying them that way? And it's like, because uh, we don't want them to come back. And they did this whole ceremony and, and he thought that was so fascinating that he kind of started thinking and, and he's like, com- couldn't believe that people would really believe that. But then he's just like, well, it's very interesting. What if these guys really did come back? I would be completely ill-prepared to handle it. I don't know what I would do. And that gave him the idea to like create this idea of this werewolf with people who really don't believe in things like werewolves, only to have them actually attacked by werewolves. And so he wrote this script back in 69, and he started pitching it, trying to get work out of it, and he couldn't get anything out of this script, although it did get him a lot of other work. And from that other work, he got, you know, start to start directing stuff. And eventually he found people who wanted to make this. But the problem that he was finding is that it had this balance of humor and horror, uh, horror that people didn't feel worked next to each other. 
and that was the real that was the real trick and it took it took him a long time to get people to buy into it i mean from 69 all the way to 81 really and he finally was able to to find the right people to come on board and make this or and, and fund him so he could make this film but i i think that's the thing that makes this film stand out for me is it's not just a wolf horror a werewolf horror movie this actually has a very interesting uh blend of comedy and uh, and kind of horror and and not just like funny horror. I mean, it's actually some really intense horror. Yeah, yeah, it is. And it, you know, I think they've they uh, it goes back to the um, to the the cutting. I think you know, so much of it is we have shot cuts, right? These slam cuts that are you know right in the middle of um, you know otherwise maybe love scenes or you know his dream sequences they end up being these shocking uh, ghoulish masks and faces and hunting and and uh, uh, leading to the big transformation where I, I think the intensity is built in such a way that you're you're um, that it's it, it really I mean still 30 plus years uh, it's it, it it's angsty yeah 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 that this i mean it goes back to our conversation on the thing how sometimes these visceral effects that are real effects um have a different intensity and they they can they have more longevity almost they do and and you know i mean it shows the you know what you can do with the camera right i think one of the one of the best sort of sequences of uh, uh thrilling sequences is the the wolf uh chase through the through the um underground mm, through the subway yeah. uh and they end up going into wolf vision which is a super you know fish eye uh run down the down the hall and so we have this this uh you know this chase where all you hear is the growling of the werewolf in the echoing through the underground and, and um the this man is I don't know how they end up in a subway in London that's totally empty, uh, <laughs> but he's he's running down these tunnels, and every every now and again it switches back to the wolf POV, and we have we're looking at this fish eye as he's chasing the guy, but we never actually see the wolf during the chase, uh, right. not until the very end, and then we see it from a way 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 distance and i love love that shot so much as the the guy is on the is on his back on the escalator with his papers strewn about and we're at the top of the escalator and you can tell the guy is terrified can't move he sees what we can't see because it's obscured by the the ceiling of the at the bottom of the escalator he sees the wolf and then you see the wolf creeping into the frame uh, so far away that we can't tell um, that you know it's a rubber wolf. Like it's it really. I mean, it looks great. Um, and yeah. finally, it finally switches to the wolf or uh, to the uh, wolf's sort of POV as he's eaten, as the guy is eaten. Well, and then going to what you were saying about the amazing editing in this film. Yeah. As as the wolf is about to attack him because we see the fright on the guy's face and as he's either about to scream or the wolf is about to growl and charge and devour the man, we cut smash cut instantly to a shot at the zoo where the lions are like roaring. Yeah. And then we cut up to all these these different zoo animals as they're as they are uh just making these noises. And I mean that's a great great use of of editing, and you you transition on the cut like that, and it's like you know Hitchcock used it on the train. I mean there's there's all those times when you know is the train goes into the tunnel or or the woman what is the I can't remember which one it is where the woman screams, and as she screams we cut to the train whistle yeah and 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 you hear the whistle instead of her scream um it might, it might be 39 steps i can't remember but it's one of those early hitchcocks it's just a, a great use of editing to to move the story along but really build that tension and this film does that time and time again absolutely does credit to the sound department for for really i mean great sound and foley sound and animal sound it's just really wonderful uh sound work on this film it it's um, really lends to the the haunting experience yeah. Uh, what do you think about the wolf? The effects of the wolf. Um I love the wolf. I I this I think is one of the creepiest werewolves I've seen. I there's something about it that just really terrifies me. And um 
I, I don't know, something about how big his mouth gets, the way his eyes look, just everything about it really kind of creeps me out. Plus, I love that it's such a, a mammoth wolf. I mean, when you do see those shots of it, as, as you see it kind of is running along the ground, um, it, it's just, it's a massive, massive thing. And it's, uh, it's just, it's terrifying. It, yeah. And, and when the cop comes into the, the porno theater in Piccadilly Circus and he flashes his flashlight up and he sees the wolf over the body as it's just like devouring the guy's innards. And it's just so disturbing. And, um, you know, everything about this werewolf, I think, is done right. Uh, from the transformation to the, the actual wolf that's running around London. I, I'm not much of a connoisseur of the werewolf oeuvre. Mm. <laughs> Do you watch many of them? Have you seen? Uh, you know, th- did you uh, did you catch the Howling and Wolfen? Uh, this was this was yes. kind of the year of the 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 three. The year of the wolf. Yeah, um, I did catch both of those, and uh, you know, I I ha- I can't say I have seen um, all the werewolf movies out there, but I've seen a good number of werewolf movies out there. Um, this one and the Wolfman, the original. Uh, stand high as far as uh, the good ones. Um, I think it definitely goes down from there. Um, I think Wes Craven's Cursed is probably way toward the bottom as far as one of the worst ones out there. Uh, and then there's middle, you know, I mean, um, I, there's, uh, I never saw Ginger Snaps. That was supposed to be an interesting kind of indie one. Um, but Silver Bullet, I, yeah. I remember really liking that. Stephen King. Um, Although it, I think it was fairly dated. Teen yeah, Wolf? but that wheelchair, man. Oh yeah, it's still Silver Bullet has its stuff. It, it really has. does. There's a lot yeah. of Gary Busey. This is before he went cuckoo crazy. Yeah. Uh, so I, that's the that uh, honestly, I mean, really, those. I think I probably saw the Howling. Um, I have no memory of it. I never saw Wolf, and I did see Silver Bullet, and obviously Teen Wolf. Um, but my, uh, you know, my understanding of werewolf lore is pretty much, you know, the Wolfman at Madame Tussauds, right? I never even saw the early Wolfman um, thing. But, but it's always a guy who turns into a wolf still wearing his clothes. Well, that, yeah, that's always kind of typically been the werewolf is, right. is, is it's a wolf man right. where it does look like a man who's just a hairy fellow right <laughs> and then and, and unfortunately i have to add i i have seen the twilight films uh, oh, yes. and yes. and there we have wolves man wolves that are also the size of volkswagens yes uh maybe a bridge too far yes just saying but this one that's one of the reasons i think this is so this this was a th- this was particularly scary is because first of all uh, you know, they do all the stuff leading up to the transformation right. But second, they they really paid attention to the detail of the transformation, right? There is nothing lost um, on that transformation. So by the time you see it, uh, you see him, his hand stretching. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I was just talking to some people about this film this week, and every one of them remembers a different part of the transformation as the most profound part like scary moment of that film right it's either the hand or the feet or the face yeah or the back when the the ridges come up the back like those sort of four sort of keystone moments in the transformation and it's all the same thing it's because that wolf you see what he goes through and david naughton's portrayal of the pain of that transformation it's not fast it is extremely slow and uh painstaking practical effect detail um to get that working right. I think that, that I think it's just terrific. Yeah. And Rick Baker, I mean, kudos to Rick Baker for really kind of inventing these sorts of, uh, effects at the time. And I I think he called them, uh, just like special makeup effects, uh, coining the phrase, which, I mean, we hear all the time, but really, I mean, I think he's the one who kind of invented it back then. Um, just came up with all this stuff and it was, it was trial just coming up with new things. And, and this is a proof in the pudding that give your effects team time to come up with something. I mean, he had a good chunk of time to develop all the stuff for this, and they will be able to do something amazing. I mean, I, I can't remember how much time he had, but he definitely had a long chunk of time to really kind of explore his tools and find the right way to do all these different effects. 
And, uh, you know, Landis came to Rick Baker early on and said, look, I want to do this uh, transformation in a bright room, uh, just fluorescent room. I don't want to do it in the shadows. And I don't want it to be uh, a simple thing where it's just uh, like like uh, Lon Chaney Jr. in The Wolfman where he's just kind of sitting in a chair and through a bunch of different crossfades, you watch as all, all this you know transformation happens. I want this to be something where we really see it in, in real time and I don't want to cut. Now, they obviously decided that they could do it better. They could emphasize different things when they cut. Um, but they kept it in a very bright room. They kept it in a place where you got to watch all of this stuff happen. And everything going on in there, all of the amazing effects and how Rick Baker figured out how to do all these different things as far as, you know, doing the, I don't, I don't know what he was doing, but the, had had the little, the injector pumps in the hand to make the fingers grow or the foot grow, mm -hmm. the things bubble out the back, the, you know, doing the reverse shot of the hair growing so that it, I, you know, or pulling through so that when you reversed it, it looks like it's growing. Uh, and, you, and, and they even had a time where David was in the floor and just his head and his arms were out and then he had a whole werewolf body. I mean, they, they used every trick in the book to, to make this work. And, I mean, he won an Oscar for it, uh, rightly so. And I, I think um, this is a, a film that really changed how uh, makeup effects could be used in films. And I think if you look at all those films that came after this, it's very clear. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Especially uh, Werewolf in a Women's Prison. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, you know, that's that's one of my favorites. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I got sidetracked by our last conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I just get a catalog of all the films I've never seen. How about a Mexican werewolf in Texas? Have you seen that? No? I, Doubt I, it. <laughs> Doubt it. There's a whole series of them in there. There sure is. Now, let me tell you, back to practical effects. <laughs> back to your conversation. One of the things I like so much about this, even though some of the werewolf maulings are, you know, fairly gratuitous. The best sequence in the film, and I think the the sequence that that capitalizes on the humor horror uh, aspect of an American Werewolf in London is the chaos at uh, in Piccadilly. Yeah, uh, at the end of the film. So we we have him right. He's changed. He's he's locked into the theater, and then he starts to come out. Right. He he wants to come out. And he's they they manage to you know, close the the big sliding door. The big shutter door. The big shutter door, and he starts banging on it. And so, and everybody thinks, yeah, I, I guess, the collective sort of mob thinking sets in, and they all pile up against the door. And then chaos ensues. Uh, he, he comes out, the wolf comes out, and is wandering through Piccadilly, and Piccadilly falls apart. Well, at first, he pop, he runs out. Yeah. And he he grabs the head of uh, Scotland Yard. Oh, he does the rip neck, the head, and off. he yes. he pops his head off like a dandelion, yes. and it rolls down the hood of the car. That is right. really good. <laughs> but then Piccadilly falls apart, and some of the like the grossest deaths in the film happen during like car crashes, and when the bus, <laughs> the bus, the double decker bus, uh, it's jackknifes. I guess it doesn't really jackknife, but it it. Skids into the side. There's a 360. It slides into some other cars. A guy falls out of it and is then fully run over. Like his head is just run over by another car. I mean, it happens so fast. So many people get just crushed under their own uh, panic. And uh, it reminded me a little bit of um, of the the one we talk about so often with the what is it, the Hollywood one where the kid gets beaten up at the end. Mm, yes, Day of the Locust. Day of the Locust. Like at the end, it's just, it's just mayhem and chaos, uh, and uh, it it's it really is beautiful. Now, watching how they planned to shoot it, I don't know. Maybe you want to talk more detail about this. But what I what I understand was they they shot it there on location, Piccadilly Circus, and and it was supposed to be like an eight camera shoot, and their whole plan was to empty Piccadilly Circus out, clear it out, block it off for like two minutes and do this sequence and then 
they would have an army of cleanup people to come in and clean it up and it, everything would be fine. Right. A two minute mayhem scene. Right. Uh, and were they able to do that? According to what I heard, everybody says yes. Is that amazing? That blows my mind. I, I, I you know, it, but it, it's interesting because the first thing that popped into my mind is like, this is the exact same thing that they made Danny Boyle do with 28 Days Later, getting all those barren shots yeah. of London as, uh, as the guy's walking through. This is the same thing. It's like you, we just can't shut the city down. And so they gave them this tiny window of time, and they had rehearsed, and they figured out how to – They, I think they had to put an extra wheel under the double-decker bus and, and with a like a, a, a pump or something. At the right moment, they'd push the pump, and it'd pop this wheel up, which would make it spin like that. And so they came they, – they rehearsed it off-site. They got everything down perfect, so they knew what was going on. And then they had all the pieces in place, and yeah, they when when they locked it off, go. Two minutes later, they were sweeping the streets. That blows me away. I know it. It floored me when I when I heard that. Yeah, so. yeah. That is a that's an amazing sequence, and it's one of the most fun sequences in the uh, in the film for me. I think it's it's wonderful. Yeah, and, and and you know, and I will say, in those two minutes, I mean. That's just mostly the car crash, like the wide shot car crash stuff that they were actually filming in Piccadilly Circus. A lot right. of the close up shots of like, you know, a car going through someone's uh, like right. a storefront window. Those were shot in, in Those studio were shot or, you know, in or, the... or in another town yeah. somewhere else where they kind of made it look like their own little Piccadilly Circus. Right. But for the, the big stuff where you could tell this is really Piccadilly Circus, those were really Piccadilly Circus. Yeah. It was. It's a wonderful sequence. Really yeah. fun. Uh, well, it speaks, and it speaks to. And I know we keep drilling this home in this 1981 series, but I, I just feel like my estimation of Escape from New York just drops every time I watch another movie. <laughs> it's like, look what John Landis did, John Carpenter. Yeah. I mean, it. He made. I mean, he found ways to just be really ingenious and inventive with the money that he had in order to tell this amazing story and create this fantastic world. I mean, he only had two minutes to get that shot for Pete's sake. I mean, yes. what could you have done to have made your future New York better? That's right. Instead, he made Batman three. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! Wow. Right? Am I right? Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Can we talk about? Uh, let's talk about David and Jack. Yes. Can we? I love this because in even though this is also sort of a love story, as he, as as uh, our intrepid uh, werewolf hero, David Kessler is uh, in a budding relationship with his nurse. Mm -hmm. This is also kind of a buddy movie. Uh, it's it's a very strange buddy movie where one of the buddies is killed and comes back as undead, uh, trying to convince his buddy to kill himself. Yeah. Uh, and I love their relationship as it as it goes on. First of all, Griffin Dunn I think is is terrifically funny in this film, uh, and and um, understated. He gives me that same. Uh, it feels a little bit like like bosom buddies. Uh, <laughs> In, in this film. And, and so I, you know, I, I really like that. I love their relationship that builds right on the roads and the moors. Um, you know, the, their conversation about women and, you know, life and what they're doing. I mean, it, it's, it's a great setup, but then this, you know, in the, in the porno theater at the end, um, he, you know, Kessler looks over at Jack and says, man, I'm really glad to see you. And Jack is a decaying corpse whose eyeballs are like practically falling out of his head and he has no cheek anymore. It's this wonderful sort of animatronic or uh, <laughs> mask of, of Jack. And he says, I'm glad to see you too. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so great. Yeah. Uh, how do you, uh, how do you feel about the buddies? Oh, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think they have a great relationship. It's clearly one that is designed to, uh, to uh, to last in, over the course of the film, and it works really well. And you have those moments where, I mean, yes, Jack is telling David to kill himself and and relaying all the horrors that he's going to be inflicting on everything, but he does it with such pleasant 
uh, a pleasant tone. And I, I mean, I think John Landis had told him to just always be cheerful. And, and he does always seem cheerful, even when he's talking, telling his friend he needs to kill himself. Yeah. And even at that last scene in the porno theater that you're talking about, um, when all of these other undead <laughs> that he has now killed are all there as well, telling him all these different ways to off himself, one of the homeless guys, and the homeless guys of all of them are the most pissed off of all of them, which strikes me as so funny because everyone else seems like they would be more angry uh, because, you know, I, you know, they, they had family, they had all this stuff, but these homeless guys are so bitter. Yeah. And, and uh, the guy's like, oh, I don't care if you, if it's painful to hang yourself or whatever. And, and Jack defends him. He's just like, Hey, this is my friend here. I don't want to see him suffer. Right. I love his middleman role. It's really terrific. And you're yeah. so right. I hadn't quite made that connection about how the homeless guys were the most angry ones, uh, the <laughs> most bitter ones, because it, it really does feel like, okay, you have actually managed to take from us our very last dignity. Right. Like, right. We're, like this is why it's so bad. We'd already come to terms with the fact that we were, that we were, you know, living by the, the flaming oil can, but now you've killed us. Right. It's it's such a great sort of British insult uh to them. Yeah. Which is wonderful. Is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh David Naughton is He's a pepper. Really? <laughs> I have not been able to get that out of my head since you sent that. I had no connection to that, but it turns out he was the He was pepper. the pepper. He was the pepper. <laughs> and he's the one who told everybody else what kind of pepper they were. That's right. In and all he made the commercials. want to be a pepper. <laughs> he, really? I mean, he is the guy who, who, as it turns out, made me want to learn to dance in place. <laughs> <laughs> in all sorts of locations. <laughs> he is a spry individual. Yes, he is. We need to put that in the show notes. We absolutely do. I'm, I'm making a note. It's a compilation of, of uh, I think it's about eight different Dr. Pepper commercials that he had been in in uh, the late 70s, early 80s. And it's just, it's fun to see him doing that, especially <laughs> after watching this movie. Yeah. But, um, yeah. This, and that's where, uh, that's where John Landis knew him from. I mean, he had done a few other projects before this, but John Landis had seen the Dr. Pepper commercials. And when he came in to on audition, that's all they talked about. John Landis was so excited because he's a pepper too. <laughs> <laughs> and they both, they both were thrilled that they were peppers and they just talked about it. And, and that was essentially, I guess the audition and same thing with Griffin Dunn. I mean, he had, he had uh, John Landis had been looking and looking and talking to lots of people. And then when Griffin came in, there was something about him that just clicked with John Landis and they didn't even really have an audition. They just chatted and had a conversation. And then John went, into so so are you claustrophobic and and because <laughs> great well let's get started and basically like gave him the job right there and and was asking him if he's claustrophobic because he's going to have to be covered in makeup for the majority of the movie and i guess it was really hard on griffin as far as all that makeup he said it, he just felt like he was being eaten alive by bugs for the vast majority of his time <laughs> on screen oh my goodness but I, I think they're both great. I mean, David Naughton and Griffin Dunn, I think, work so well in this. And it's great. This is one of those moments where it's great getting fresh faces. I mean, they had both been in projects, but nothing big. And so getting them in something that really just kind of brought them to the forefront as fresh faces was so exciting. And, I, you know, it's one of those things. I, I love it when filmmakers still do that. I just I feel like filmmakers really feel like they have to take a risk to, to do that. And maybe John Landis did feel like he had to take a risk at the time, but... I don't know. I wish more filmmakers were still doing that. Can I tell you kind of a, can I, can I change the mood? Ooh, is it going to go dark? Or? Well, it's just a weird coincidence. Oh, okay. So, you know, uh, Griffin Dunn. Mm -hmm. Uh, so he had a sister. Okay. Do you know about this? Uh, no. His sister was Dominique Dunn. Okay. Uh, spelled with a Q U E not to be confused with his father, Dominic Dunn. Mm -hmm. I C K. So Dominique Dunn uh, was a number of things. She was in a number of, of uh, television uh, television shows, um, and uh, but you would remember her as the older sister of Carol Ann in oh. Poltergeist. Oh wow! Yes. Now, Dominique Dunn went to my high school, mm -hmm. and she graduated uh, uh, a few years before. 
I got there, right? So I was like five years. Maybe it was probably six. I don't know when she would have graduated. It was probably six, seven years before I got there. Anyway, long enough that I didn't actually know her. I wouldn't have known her. I was very young. But what I did know about her was that she graduated from my high school. She was big in the theater department, and she went on and did Poltergeist, which was awesome because everybody loved Poltergeist at the time, right? Right. And uh, so in the theater... At my high school, in the back wall, there was this giant, you know, all the graduating seniors who were, had been invested in the theater program all signed their name and did this well, you know, well-wishing for the future. And uh, there was Dominic Dunn right there. As we, well, of course, by the time I'd gotten to, to high school, uh, we knew that she had been killed. She had been strangled to death by her ex-boyfriend in 1982. Right. And it was just horrible. Yeah. Uh, and that was, and her legacy was that for for us was that signature on the wall and even as i graduated there were already rumblings that it was dominic dunn's ghost that haunted the theater at my high school mm. then they cut the high they they trashed the high school and built a or trashed the uh theater and built a new one so i don't think she's there anymore is that <laughs> a horror is that crazy though that is crazy dominic dunn Wow. Yeah. Unrelated no, to American Werewolf in uh, London, but But I had no idea they were related. Yeah. Interesting. Sister. Crazy. Wow. Yeah. Dark. You know who his, who his aunt is? Uh Who's his Joan, aunt? Joan Didion, the poet. My goodness. Oh man. She writes some sexy poetry. <laughs> Does she? Oh, she wrote At the Dam, at the Hoover Dam. Woo. She wrote Hot. Uh, Yeah, Star is Born. Oh, spicy. <laughs> anyway, back to the show. What else you got? I'm sure you've got a list. Uh, you know, I, I well, I think just cast-wise, I think uh, aside from uh, David Naughton, Griffin Dunn, and the lovely Jenny Agutter. Um, Brian I, Glover. Got to talk about Brian, Brian Glover. Brian Glover and David Schofield. Roma I mean, Control. Talk about just great faces from uh, just kind of the the small town vibe I mean, they both from great faces from northern england they, they they would terrify me walking into a totally. small pub <laughs> <laughs> oh yes and brian glover of course we've talked about before yes in our alien three episode but uh so so he's great and then david schofield just has one of those faces that just always it kind of just haunts you there's something about his look truly and he's one of those guys who's just busy, busy, busy. I mean, he's in everything. He's in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Yeah. He's in Gladiator. He's in that uh, TV series, Da Vinci's Demons, that's going on. Uh, I mean, he's just, he's all over the place. Yeah. 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 And actually, John Landis worked with him uh, on his most recent film, Burke and Hare. There is, um, I, I, there is another one that really shocked me. Rick Mayall. The second anything? chess player. Yeah. Do you know anything about uh, Rick Mayall? Uh, was he Drop Dead Fred? Well, that's not how, uh, certainly not how I know him. <laughs> how do you know him? He was, I mean, he's been in a ton, ton, ton of stuff. But mm -hmm. I first discovered him in the classic TV show, The Young Ones. Ah. Did you ever see The Young Ones? I you know maybe a couple episodes long ago. Oh my goodness, that was uh, that is a, a hysterical show. If you can find the young ones, I don't whatever you have to do, BitTorrent it, whatever you have to do, find the young ones and watch Rick Mayall play. He plays Rick, uh, and his character is fantastic. It's total absurdist comedy, uh, British comedy, but it is it's really worth it. He's been, I mean, he's been, you know, he's been acting since 1980, uh, but he's been in, I mean, he has a, a significant filmography, mostly in uh, television. Um, yeah. Anyhow. And yes, Good. he was drop, drop Dead Fred. And he was Drop Dead Fred. More importantly. We don't really like to talk about that. <laughs> we don't really, no. Yeah. Uh, but please, John Woodvine is in it. He's great as just the serious doctor. I mean, he's the sort of person who plays the serious doctor very yeah. well. Yeah. And he's still just crazy busy in uh, working. And uh, strange appearance of Frank Oz. <laughs> yeah, what's up with that? 
<laughs> that was the strangest thing. And Especially boy, because the credit that he gets in this movie as both Mr. Collins and Miss Piggy, because they actually watch <laughs> the Muppets on television, <laughs> and he's also in the movie. Right. <laughs> it was great. It was very funny to see him. And then he also appeared in uh, John Landis' uh, uh, Spies Like Us, so I think they must be buddies. Oh, what that was a... That's another deep. movie I don't want to watch again. It was because so, you're afraid. It, because I'm so afraid. That'll be, oh gosh, what do we call that? I don't know. Yeah, we named that. The terror flop. The, I don't know the, what that is. What it wasn't the call? Prometheus effect. It was one of those effects yeah, we, where you watch something you defined. loved. Yeah. But yeah, he's, it was very weird to see Frank Oz pop up. And I think more than anything else that I've actually seen Frank Oz in, this one really, I swear, when I was watching him on screen, it really felt like Fozzie Bear talking. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man, <laughs> that's really funny. <laughs> you just can't shake it. I uh, know he can't. He can't. So that was funny to yeah. see him pop up there. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Who else do we have? Uh, well, the uh, there's not a whole lot of score in this film, but what there is is fantastic. Elmer Bernstein did the score, and it just I think it works really well. Uh, and then aside from the score. That was something else that uh, John Landis uh, did that was interesting is he was trying to put in as many moon-related songs as he could. You got Blue Moon and uh, 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 Bad Moon Rising. And he, I guess he really tried to get uh, Cat Stevens' song Moon Shadow in the film. But Cat Stevens turned him down because apparently at the time, Cat Stevens uh, refused to have his, fil- his song used in this film about werewolves because apparently... He really believed in werewolves at the time. I guess I'm not surprised by that. What? <laughs> what? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, dear. Yep. yep. Well, you know, that... you go through phases. Yeah, right, right. Now he's in his, uh, his a totally different phase. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yep. yep. Uh, let's see who else. Uh, Robert Painter did the uh, cinematography, and I think it's it's very effective cinematography. He'd been doing cinematography for uh, quite a while. I mean, and he'd worked with John Landis number number of times, Trading mm-hmm. Places. He worked on that. Um, he worked on, jeez, uh, I mean, S- Superman Two. He worked on uh, just going back. I mean, this guy's been working since the fifties on uh, on projects. So he's he's a a British DP that really knows his stuff. This was a film shot in London that uh, at the time John Landis really had to uh, get permission to film there. Um, I, I can't remember what it was about the, uh, you know, the, the, the way that they had to film in England, but they were only allowed to bring, I think, like three or four Americans over and everybody else on the crew had to be British. And so John Landis was obviously one and David Naughton was two. They gave Griffin Dunn a really hard time. They weren't going to let him come. They were going to say, you're going to have to cast that guy with a Brit. And John Landis actually threatened them and said, oh, I, I've already scouted Paris. I'll just go film this in Paris. And that's what finally made them change their mind and let him film in London. And uh, I found that very funny considering that the sequel that came six, 16 Werewolf years later. Paris. Yeah, American Werewolf in Paris, which is a fairly terrible film, as I recall. Although, I, honestly, I don't remember it all that well. Yeah, I don't either. Totally. But I actually, I'm not entirely sure I saw it. I was fascinated by who was in it. Uh, yeah. None of the same people and none of the same crew. It's a wholly different essentially a wholly different property. Although it is an, a, an actual sequel yeah. where they say that Alex, uh, Jenny Agutter's character, was impregnated when he was the werewolf and the, her child is now, this is his story. Yeah. Or her story. So I can't remember it, which one. I don't even remember which one was her kid. I don't remember. It takes it to a pretty weird place. Yes. That's what happens there. Uh, same thing with uh, editing Malcolm Campbell. Um edited uh he worked with landis on a number of films spies like us three amigos coming to america uh after american werewolf in, Lo- in london mm-hmm. and again i think between the cinematography and the editing and the film i think it's it it's a it works yeah. for what it is it works really really well so absolutely 
Right. And then I think the the last thing that I had was this is a Peter Goober uh, and uh, and John Peter film, the whole um, Goober Peters production team that uh, had been uh, notorious for quite a while. And I, you know, Peter Goober was on uh, what was that show that he was on forever, that fantastic show. The uh, I'm blanking on the name of it. Show? Yeah, it was uh, the the show business show shootout. Do I even know he, that he was, show? He was, he was the host. It was, it was him and uh, uh, Variety's Peter Bart. They sat down and they would talk with, uh, you know, filmmakers, actors, and just have these. It was a Sunday morning shootout. It was just this fantastic show where, where the two of them um, would just talk about just film, and it was great, fantastic show. Never heard of it. Oh, it's definitely one that's uh, that's. I don't even know if you can track it down, but it was a great show when it was on. But these two were just a you know producing duo that really cranked out a lot of great stuff. I mean, they started working. Uh, I, I don't know when they started working together in the '70s, I think. But um, this was one of their big ones, and uh, they just really kind of kept carrying it along for a very long time. I mean, they did um, Tim Burton's Batman. They and they did uh, Rain Man. These guys are some people who made some some pretty big films. So as a, as a producing pair, this was a you know you'd see this name quite a bit. The Goober Peters uh, names. Wow, did you know Peter Goober did The Deep, Robert mm-hmm. Shaw, not yeah. with not with uh, his buddy, not with John. That was a good movie, The Deep. Anyway, I don't remember liking that one. I just like it, Robert Shaw so much. Yeah, it has been a long time since I think I've the problem with The Deep was, and I don't mean to sidetrack us, but the problem with The Deep was, that I remember, was that it, it, it came out, you know, it came out at a bad time. Mm. It was, it was it, you know, it was the second one, right? After Jaws. Well, that was the problem. Any of those underwater movies yeah. coming out right after Jaws. Yeah. Anyhow. All right. Hey, good talk about that. Yes. I think, are we ready to talk? How did it do with the money? Um, you know, I, I said it it did pretty well, but it it was a film that didn't do that well it, it, right away. This is a film that needed to find the cult following. Um, the problem was, I don't know, I think some of it was the marketing. I mean, you look at the movie posters for it, and, and they're all like, uh, you know, from John Landis, who, the director of Animal House, he brings yeah. you a, a whole different animal. It's like, hmm, that's, you know, they're they're pumping his comedy side when really they need to find a different way to go about it. And I think that kind of threw audiences a bit going in expecting more animal house comedy yeah. and coming out watching a wolf, you know, eviscerate a man's, uh, in his stomach, yeah. <laughs> it's like eating his intestines. It, it's, it definitely took people by surprise. Um, and, but it still did pretty well for itself. This is a film that cost uh, $10 million to make at the time, which adjusted is about $25.6 million. It uh, ended up making domestically um, 30, almost $32 million. So that's about 81, almost $82 million. And internationally, about uh, $76.8 million um, adjusted. And so it definitely made its money back, but it was, you know, it was a film that just kind of audiences had a hard time getting into it. And then I think once word of mouth was created, then it found its audience and that's how it ended up making its money at the box office. But yeah, all told adjusted, it made about $1.4 million per finished minute. Okay, so it did all right. I, you know, I, I hadn't made that connection about the, the, uh, about the marketing pieces. This was, I mean, wow, right after Kentucky Fried Movie, Animal House, and the Blues Brothers. Yeah. And now he's making effectively a horror film. Yeah, it was a totally different thing for him. Yeah. I mean, he really did step out. I mean, if you look at Schlock, his first movie, it, I mean, it's, it, it's, I don't know. It's a like a girl, a blind girl who falls in love with a gorilla thinking it's her dog or something. I mean, it sounds completely silly, but at least it was a little more in the creature yeah, stuff, yeah. you know, and, and Rick uh, Baker did the did the gorilla on that one, too. Um, but then it's just all comedy. And even after An American Werewolf in London, I mean, Twilight I mean, he, Zone, the movie. Yeah. Twilight that, Zone, he did the first segment. Which one was that? Was that the you want to see something really scary? No, that's that's the prologue because that's how yeah, that's he did the, film the prologue ends. too, right? 
Yeah, but I don't remember which I don't remember which segment is which in uh, in that film. Yeah. Except that. Uh, um, oh wait, was his the one the the war one that uh, that had that uh, the helicopter crash? Yeah, I I don't remember. Yeah, I actually I, don't remember anything else besides you want to see something really scary. Right. That's too bad. Yeah, anyway, he, yeah, so he did that. And then everything after, I mean, Spies Like Us, Three Amigos, Coming to America, uh, you know, uh, Trading Places, uh, <laughs> Beverly Hills Cop 3. <laughs> really? The Stupids. The Stupids. Yeah. I, I, he strikes me as a filmmaker who hit his stride in the late 70s, early 80s, and then essentially stuck with it and never kind of changed with the times. Yeah. Because, I mean, I started watching uh, Burke and Hare, the film that he did in 2010 with uh, Simon Pegg, and uh, I really had a hard time getting through it. It just was, <laughs> there's something about it that was just really, really awful. And, um, yeah, I still haven't finished it. I'm I'm tempted to go back and try, but I don't know. Was there's that, something about... Was that the one with, uh, what's his name? Uh, Andy Circus. Andy Circus. Yeah. Simon Pegg and Andy Circus, right? They're Burke and Hare. They are uh, trying to provide cadavers, trying to make money. So they start, I think they start killing people to sell them as cadavers to this, the medical school. <laughs> well, see, it's, it got a chuckle out of me. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely dark and it, it has it, you know, something going on. I don't, just watching it, or as much as I made it through, it felt very dated. Yeah. It felt like a filmmaker from the 80s who hadn't transitioned to the modern age. Right. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, let's rank it, shall we? Let's do it. Hey, head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel. And you can see our now completely and 100% refreshed, reordered, and revised top list of our very favorite films that we've talked about on this film. On this mm-hmm. show, and uh, several that we are not our favorites. <laughs> yes, yeah, several. All right, here we go. An American Werewolf in London, or The Born Supremacy. It's funny. I feel like I've heard that one a lot. <laughs> uh, I would do. I would do Werewolf. I would do Werewolf over Supremacy. How about against Forrest Gump? I would probably do Werewolf over Forrest Gump. Just you know, in terms of what I would put on, mainly because it's shorter. Well, it definitely does have the brevity factor. I think as a film that, uh, gosh, this is, this is actually kind of hard because I mean, Forrest Gump. I, I actually, I don't, I don't think it's that hard. I think better, better angels should intervene here. It's Forrest Gump. <laughs> it's definitely one that's easier to put on with the kids than American Werewolf in London. <laughs> I, uh, as a side note, uh, terrified my daughter to the point of nightmares needing to come in and sleep in our bed last night because of the mere sound of the transformation that she heard. Oh, wow. Yeah. She said, oh, what's that? I said, werewolf. She went to bed. Hour later, she's in my bed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> again, kudos to the sound department. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. American Werewolf or Barton Fink. I do a werewolf. Okay. 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 Uh how about against Intacto? I would do I would werewolf. Do werewolf. Still. Yeah, yeah. I would do werewolf. Let's see. Um how about Drive 2011? I would do Drive. Would you? Yeah. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Over Werewolf. That's a tricky one. Werewolf has, you know, it's it's got the longevity factor. It's uh it's been around a little longer. Got a little bit uh firmer hold on a firmer bite. On my heart. I oh, really? Say. Really? With bite <laughs> you're going to use? <laughs> oh, yeah. What a, you know, what a... Really? I, I don't know. Albert Brooks? He's good. He's pretty good. It's good. This is... Th- this is a film that's going to stick around forever. Just think about Rick Baker and his effects. No, I, I don't disagree with that. I, I know it, it's I, not... I, I, uh, I, I would likely put on drive uh first i just love the idea of drive you know i kind of a sucker for the these kinds of driving movies Mm -hmm. hired hand drivers right right i like these like uh, i generally like these movies 
Well, Brian Cranston, Albert I know. Brooks. I know. It's a, it's a great cast. It does, but it doesn't have a werewolf in it. <laughs> All right, so you're telling me you're pretty firm. Like on a scale of 1 to 10. I, yes. On a, what are you on a 1 to 10? Because uh, I'm at about a 6. I could I, be pushed I'd over say, if you're higher than a 6. I'm at an 8. All right. All right, we'll go with you. Okay. Phew. How about uh, an American werewolf in London or about a boy who's not a werewolf in London? I imagine you're going to say about a boy. I am actually really torn on this one. I am torn. I may say werewolf. Really? Yeah, but I would see. I would say werewolf in this case. All right. Well, let's say werewolf then. All right. All right. Uh, how about against being there? Hmm. I'm still saying werewolf. Wow. Okay. I know. I, I, I'm i shocking myself. I would, I would I, say werewolf too, but that surprises me for you. It surprises me for me. I wasn't thinking I would go that high. Look at that. 35 out of 135. Fantastic. Sandwiched between Forrest Gump and being there. <laughs> There's an interesting That's family. Right. Yeah, right? <laughs> Watch those right in a row. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. Where did we go from here? If I recall, we have two more in this series of 1981 films. Two more. And next yeah. week, where do we go? We're getting down to it. We're going to hop on down to Australia and watch Peter Weir's Gallipoli. Mm. Right. Ace hey, Roy. Mel Gibson. Your Vegemite. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Have some shrimp on the barbie. Shrimp on the barbie and Vegemite. Maybe a kangaroo. <laughs> uh, we got to land the bogo pogo. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. That's going to be a super annoying episode. Uh, if we talk like that, it will be. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, All man. right. Uh, I'm looking forward to that one. I haven't seen that one uh, probably since 1981. I doubt I saw that in 1981. I've seen it fairly recently, and because uh, I, I couldn't remember it. It was one of those that I just, I knew I had seen, but I didn't even know what it was about. <laughs> so I watched it again, and I liked it. I remember liking it. And so I'm, I'm curious to go back and revisit it more recently just to try to get more of the story. Yeah, me too. And, uh, yeah, absorb. Take it like all a, in. Like a sponge. Yeah, that's good. Hey, yes. it's been a good talk. I like this film. I'm glad it landed where it did, and uh, people should go see it. Yes, yes, they definitely should. All right. I'm out of here, Andy. I gotta go to bed. Yes. I think I'm gonna go actually try to crank on my uh, uh, Michael Mann. I might go watch Public Enemies. I'm interested to see what you think about that. Yes. Since it's not a full moon tonight. Yeah, no, don't. Right now, I really. So what do you got? I've got a review, a two-star review by Meh. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to name yourself Meh, Meh as as your user review name, you can guarantee it's not going to be anything higher than a two. I mean, right, I'm right, sorry, pretty much. Right? <laughs> the bar is already fairly low. Yep. Let me start off by saying boo. <laughs> when I rented this, I thought I was going to be seeing the one I remember so well, but turns out that's the sequel probably and not this movie. An hour and a half of mostly disappointment. I mean, the first transformation, I guess you could call it, happens about an hour into it. Now I know it's 1981, but come on, could do better. As a diehard werewolf fan, I was disappointed in this film because some of it didn't even make sense. The sex bits that were here and there were nice, but not needed in a werewolf film. I'm sorry to say that I do not recommend this film to any werewolf fan like me. <laughs> the sex bits were nice. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you read that. With Okay, now I know it was 1981. <laughs> <laughs> well, his, let's just say, meh, it doesn't really have a good sense of, of punctuation.
Oh, it, it's all lowercase and it's all just like commas scattered through. So it's really hard to tell where I'm supposed to like full stop. <laughs> That's too funny. I, you know, um, what do you have? A lot of people complaining about the quality of the film. Mm hmm. Now I know it was 1981, but really, <laughs> uh, you know what I like about Kitty Meow, who gives it a three star review. I it, it's it's like I wonder what her motivation was for watching this movie. She says the effects in this movie are dated, but I'm sure they must have been cutting edge when the movie first released. Still, I like the shots of the English countryside and the pub culture. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying that maybe Kitty Meow watched this movie for the wrong reason. Wow, yeah. Kitty Meow needs to go watch, uh, you know, some little British film or something like... Yeah, uh, yeah I'm just saying. The Remains of the Day or something. That's, that <laughs> would be a place to start. Inside. Yes. Oh. <laughs> All right. Enough there you go. Them. It is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great conversations over the years about so many great movies. And some stinkers. Well, true. But you know, producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchase is made through our links. Give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. In season three, we covered even more great adaptations like The Night of the Hunter and It Happened One Night, both part of our Couples on the Run series. We talked about No Country for Old Men. The Coen brothers so rarely adapt someone else's work. We had some fun rom-com adaptations like About a Boy, based on the Nick Hornby novel, and Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist, adapted from Rachel Cohn and David Levithan's book. In our terribly and naively named foreign language series, we discussed the brilliant City of God and the Diving Bell and the Butterfly, which I won't ever be able to watch again, ever. But could you read the original memoir? I don't know, maybe? We had our Richard Dysart series with adaptations like The Day of the Locust and Being There. Plus, we had that fantastic interview with the man himself. <laughs> the one where we had him sit on the floor? Because this chair was so squeaky. <laughs> Good times. We did our first Tom Hanks series with Forrest Gump, adapted from Winston Groom's novel, plus Apollo 13, based on Lost Moon by Jim Lovell. And we did another year series looking at films from 1981, including Das Boot, Gallipoli, and Thief, all based on books. Listeners can dive deeper into all of these original stories and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book, play, movie, video game. Video game. <laughs> you bet. We have talked about some video game adaptations as well. It doesn't matter the source, just follow the link. Every purchase supports the podcast. Check out the full list at thenextreel.com slash originals and get reading, watching, performing, or playing today. Today. 